This is one of the emperors of Morocco. This is uh, Ishmael, 16, uh, 1670. One of the emperors of Morocco who was known to have owned several Europeans as slaves. Now, a lot of people who are part of the African community or the African American community are often made to feel somewhat inferior because people say, well, you know, all you all ever did was descend from some slaves. And of course, you can believe that me being in West Virginia, I've had a lot of students, a lot of European American students who come in the classes, you know, expecting to hear about the history of African American enslavement and the history of European Americans being the masters. And of course, I come from another direction. I begin at the beginning. And I deal with the issue of even where the word slave came from. Then we go back to that Slavic thing again, right? See, remember homeboy earlier talking about, you know, uh, the Slavic peoples being less than homo sapien. Well, yeah, some of the Germanic peoples thought so. And they had pressed them into servitude so much that their name became synonymous with servitude. Hence, slave. So when we look at the situation in its entirety. We recognize that no one has a monopoly on being enslaved. The only thing is, in recent, more recent history, African peoples were the most recently enslaved en masse. But when you have a long memory, you can remember something different and eliminate that notion of never having made any significant contribution to anything, always being a slave. Because when one thinks that they descend from slaves, and that's their focus, they continue to act like slaves. Well, this is uh, backwards, but what that says is more. And it says it's from a collection of the Lehigh County Historical Society. You have Moors in the coats of arms. OK, I'll just explain where that, where that is from. Moors in the coats of arms of European families. And here's what's significant. When you consider that the European world today tries to hide as much as possible about their African links, their connection to African people, it is nothing short of profound. When you go and look at heraldic texts, texts which show the coats of arms, the symbols of European families, and in it you find you. It's obvious that they're saying there was a time when we wanted to show you off as part of the family. We wanted to show you off so much that we put it in books which would be passed down for posterity. We have coats of arms hanging up in our homes showing you, African man and African woman, Asiatic, they're letting you know the way things used to be. They're not afraid to say it. Morrison, son of a Moor, Morris. In fact, I just say I, a dear friend of mine passed away yesterday morning. His name was Lewis John Morris, also known as Skyman. He was, Nick, he was given that name essentially because he was was working, building bridges between African Americans and Native Americans, and the Lakota people gave him the name Skyman. He passed away yesterday. So I said that I would dedicate uh, this lecture to him. But to find this legacy within European family coats of arms, tells us that they obviously felt differently about us at some point. Otherwise, they wouldn't talk about us in a positive way. They wouldn't have us in the coats of arms. Now, what's intriguing is this. When I first started doing the research on the Moors, and I was looking at the presence of the Moors in European coats of arms, I found that the Moors, the term Moor and Moors, was always noted in the description of European books published in Europe. But when the books were reprinted in the United States, they changed the term to Negro. So you would look up, you know, the Morrison coat of arms, 
And instead of seeing, you know, a Moor's head, you know, reefed about the temples, you would see a Negro's head wreathed about the temples. Now, that may not seem like a whole lot unless you understand the meaning of the word Negro, and unless you understand why these people were actually doing that. They were trying to disconnect the Moors from European history. But again, the, the phonetic sound of Moor was still there. It keeps coming up. Morrison, Moreau, Moore, Mordant, Morley, Morgan, and then some other names like Stuart, and Halliburton, and Gleam, and Brokas, Zamoras, all these names, even Zangermeister, or Singmaster, and I heard someone else say Douglas, which is Celtic for behold the Moor, or behold the black-skinned man. This is more, it's okay, you don't have to turn, turn that around. I, I, you know. Basically, this is another armorial bearing coming from the, an English family, Moore. And this is from Fox Davies' The Art of Heraldry. Oh, and that one needs to be turned around. <laughs> that one's uh, upside down. Uh, nature knows no color line. And he helps us really to understand, too, how once these coats of arms made their way into the European American community, the change in the term to Negro is given. Now, look at the names, if I read off the names. Maurice, Mormon, 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 Morcant, Moore, Mortison, Moreau, Morel, Morelli, right? All these Moors, just more, 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 right? But then when you look at the bottom and look at the top, Negroes in coats of arms of noble families, French, Dutch, and Belgian families with names of Negro. Now, it is possible, it is possible, Rogers did that when he put it in. But given, the, in, in order to explain to people in the 1950s who the people were, to say, you know, because at that time they were calling themselves Negroes. So you were Negro, so this more, you respond to Negro, you won't respond to more. That's what people, you know, that's what most people were in the 1950s. So that's possible. But I'm here to tell you that it's also true that people would change the term. European American publishers would change the term. These are additional coats of arms from coats of arms showing Moors. There's one more there coming up out of a crown. Stuart, another Moorish sister wearing a crown. Uh, Brokus, a sister with bat wings coming out of her head. So which seems to suggest, I spoke to a, a colleague about that in terms of medieval symbol, seems to suggest that this was someone involved in some type of alchemy. You have someone on the, on the bottom here, uh, Stuart in the middle, Mason, the middle one with three, three faces. In fact, for the family name Mason, it says three Moors heads conjoined on one neck. And if one is wondering about the connection between Mason and Moore, you should continue to wonder, because there is a connection. Halliburton, on the end, who was the Moor with the helmet. This is Johannes Morris, who was one of the rulers of Sicily. Johannes Morris, one of the rulers of Sicily, 12th century. 12th century. The Moors were in Sicily until 957 and in Crete until about 1026. 
So when people start, you know, recognizing, when you see, you know, some people who are Italian walking around, and unless they open their mouth and told you they were Italian, you would say, well, you look just like, you know, my uncle or my, my brother, you know. Because of the Moorish presence. And not even just the Islamic era Moors, but even before that time. This is the Zangemeisters I was talking about. Zangemeister, a Singmaster. Good German family. Good German family whose ancestry is linked to a Moorish teacher of music who came to Berlin at the end of the 16th century and taught music. And he married a German woman. And the family then became known as the Zengermeisters, or the Singmasters. And what, again, is interesting is, when I got this information, I went to the Lehigh County Historical Society to find any information of family histories and so forth. These were things that good German Americans were collecting and had, you know, in their own family. So again, these are people who say, well, I recognize who y'all are, even if you don't recognize who you are. See, and we need to, rec we need to realize that, uh, again, a lot of us, unfortunately, won't move until the European says move. That's why I say I like to hit him in the bloodline, because the point I'm making is, when we illustrate that the European academics and Europeans who are informed know your legacy, then some of us really start, you know what, I think maybe he's right. Because I heard him say it. I heard, that, heard this European-American makes it. So I just lay it out, you know? 